So even though I love talking about our brand, there's no one at IBM who is more eloquent about our brand and can talk more beautifully about our brand than our CMO, John Awada. So I thought I'd have him join me on stage via video. And um, you could just hear him talk about our brand for a couple minutes before we get started. So if we could play the first video. records and the archives of IBM, you don't find too many documents that describe the management or stewardship of the IBM brand at all. Despite the fact that over 50 years and 80 years and now 100 years, the brand has grown to be quite an asset, globally recognized, respected, and valued. What I've concluded is that we don't try to manage the IBM brand, we try to manage our character as a business. And we've never defined IBM by what we are selling. We've learned that at some point in the future, if you make that mistake, uh, you will have to go through a lot of expense and trouble to take out of people's hearts and minds that definition of IBM because the punch card will have had its day or this electric typewriter, the mainframe, the PC, Watson, cloud, analytics, all those things. And so if you're not gonna define our brand by what we make, what defines us? And it comes back to this notion of our corporate character, and that's our belief system and our purpose and our mission and what makes us us. We tend to that, the brand takes care of itself. Once we have a sense of what makes us us, it actually is quite clarifying. It also compels us to keep changing while making sure we don't change things that should never change and that must endure. That is very, very helpful as we make decisions every day to drive us to the future while maintaining fidelity with the company we wish to be. So given that, our brand strategy is very simple. Be a great company and therefore a great brand. Uh, you saw the Abraham Lincoln quote, the great company, you know, be, be focused on the tree and the shadow or the brand will follow. So we don't manage the brand, we manage our character, we manage our company and the rest follows. We also believe, uh, hmm, there we go. We also believe leaders of great companies make four deliberate choices about things. Those things are an enduring idea, who you serve, how you're experienced, and how you're differentiated. So I'll take a quick minute and talk about IBMs because this is the foundation for everything we do in the content space and entire marketing space. We try and keep things in, these things in mind all the time. So our enduring idea, world-changing progress. That has been it for our entire 103-year history. You can see it, you know, whether it was you know, cheese slicers or, or Watson, we are about um, making the world work better and you know, making, making pro continuous progress with our, with our clients and our customers. Um, in service of forward thinkers. So we believe that forward thinkers are people who really look at the world around them and try and understand what's going on and, and really believe that the application of technology and science and reason and logic can absolutely impact their business, their profession, their organization, their city, whatever. Um, and they are not afraid to act. They're not afraid to think differently. That's a forward thinker. We're experienced to the IBMer. You did not go to the store and buy an IBM off the shelf. You know, but we have 430,000 people, um, IBMers, experts in their field, and mo many of them are sellers. So many of the people who interact with IBM are interacting through a seller, but you might learn about or hear about or feel IBM through people like me on, on this kind of stage or through our proprietary events or through using IBMers in TV spots or in long form video um, or, or what have you. So we are experienced through the IBMer. So how we treat the IBMer and our internal um, and employee programs are really critical to our brand. Um, and then we feel we're differentiated um, by not just our values, but living our values. So we have three core values. All companies have their values. Any IBMer can state them. Um, but we also have spent time helping IBMers figure out how to live those values by creating behaviors or practices that enable them to live those values. So I, I, I only go through all this because it is a really important part of, um, again, anything that we do across the company, these things are always kept in mind. So um, 
IBM, you know, most, most people know, but I will just kind of reiterate that IBM is one of the biggest companies in the world with $100 billion in revenue, 430,000 employees operating in 170 countries. We sell hardware products, software products, consulting services. We have um, big solutions in areas of cloud computing, big data and analytics, social technologies, mobile technologies. We have c cognitive computing. We have research labs all over the world. We have you know, industry solutions in any industry, name it, from healthcare to retail um, to energy. And I, and I say all this because it gives you an understanding of how complex this business is and how complicated it is. But what we do is actually pretty simple. We help companies be more effective, be more efficient, so they can be more responsive to their clients, to their end users. Um, we help them make what they do better and, and in fact, make, make the, the world work better and, and make progress back to our enduring idea. So um, we have learned that we need to tell this really complicated story in a really simple way. Um, it's hard sometimes. You've got people in business units all over um, who are wanting to go you know, right to that deep you know, com complexity of the technology, but it's really about making it all pretty simple. Um, so again, sticking with the four, the four decisions we've made, making, our, uh, making the complex simple. Um, at the same time, we need to be engaging and surprising and newsworthy and contextual and all the things that make people want to engage with our brand and you know, really understand what we do. So about six years ago, we saw that the world was changing. We were making some observations and we called this internally uh, the three eyes. Um, not something that we really talked about externally, but the three eyes were interconnected, instrumented, and intelligent. Right? So in a you know, I have reams of you know, information on each of those, but in a nutshell, um, you know, in instrumented, just that every person, every device, every machine, things you didn't think about as computers from a car to a refrigerator was generating data. We read about this every day today, but six years ago we didn't. This was a new phenomenon. You know, more data created in a day than in all previous years, right? So um, interconnected, meaning as a result of all this data and all these machines and devices and people generating data, systems and networks are being created. All this data is starting to be connected to each other. And then intelligent means that you could take all of this interconnected, instrumented data and apply analytics and apply insight. You could now know things you never knew before. You could do things you could never do before. You could predict things you could never predict before. You could, you could simply make the world work better. And that's what we wanted to explain and talk about to our clients. This was not an advertising campaign or a marketing campaign. This was a business strategy. We had business solutions called Smarter Planet Solutions that we could actually sell. But this was a point of view on the world that we wanted to talk to the world about. Now, in order to talk to the world about that, you sometimes need a little space. So we did something a little bit different in the advertising space. Um, we created what we call op ads. So long form, every single week, once a week in the Wall Street Journal, which was incredibly painful. It was pretty much hell to get this right every single week. Because um, it's long form, it's an argument, it's a point of view, it lays out facts and evidence and people who were doing it. This was not about IBM. This was not about our products and services. This was not about selling stuff. This was a point of view to help um, and to show and to, to engage leaders and industries to help us, help build a smarter planet with us, engaging others to kind of join the party. Um, and what worked really well here is that CEOs would you know, rip this out and call up our CEO and say, wow, you get what's happening in my industry, you get what's happening in the world, you know, I want to talk to you about it. So sometime it's about not selling, not selling yourself, but putting a point of view across in the world, and, and that's really what we were doing with, with Smarter Planet. Um, I will play one TV spot um, for you if we, could, if we could run that. I have a drug problem. 10% of the world's medicine is counterfeit. Affecting over a billion people a year. On a smarter planet, we're building intelligence into things. So we can follow this medicine from the factory to the distribution center. To the pharmacy. And know it's the real thing. Keeping counterfeits off the shelves. In places like the US, Tanzania, and India, smarter medicine is safer medicine. That's what I'm working on. I'm an IBMer. Let's build a smarter planet. So you see the use of IBMers are, are how you're experienced. You see um, kind of the call to action of let's, let's build a smarter planet together, um, starting with that provocation of, you know, I have a drug problem to kind of get people engaged. But it really wasn't about selling a thing. It was about this point of view. Um, and, it, and it was kind of how we kicked off Smarter Planet. 
Um, so I will just move on here. Um, how many of you remember when Watson played and won on Jeopardy? Okay, a fair amount of people, which is good because maybe um, Eric can relate as teaching students. When I, I gave this presentation, or talked about Watson a couple months ago to a class at NYU, and when I asked them, um, it was an undergraduate class, not one person remembered Watson being on Jeopardy. It's like, okay, you know, you were in high school and you're busy with other things, but really nobody had heard of that. So it was kind of, you know, you hate when no one raises their hand. Um, but I assume that people here would, would know. Um, so Watson's a cognitive computing system, and it's a computer that's capable of answering what we call natural language questions, right? They can understand nuance and idiom and slang and the difference between, you know, this kind of bat and the hanging upside down kind of bat. It's, um, it, it was a breakthrough, a breakthrough in technology, but it was also really complicated. So, so back to the making complicated simple. In this case, it was so hard to explain that um, the researchers decided to, you know, create this um, create the systems, uh, build in the ability to play on Jeopardy. So Watson was not created to play on a game show, right? That's not what this was created for. But it was, um, Jeopardy was used as a way to really show the evidence and prove it out and to show how it could work and to get people to really understand it. People love Jeopardy, people have a passion for it, and they know how hard it is. So if you can use something like that to explain your product or your brand, or your position, then you know, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of leverage the passion people have. And it, and it worked really well. 70% um, of, of people interviewed, you know, um, surveyed, you know, had, had an understanding of what, what Watson could do and felt better, you know, good about IBM for in inventing it. But it was more about the fact that um, um, CEOs and leaders of industries were really making the connection like, oh, if Watson could do that on Jeopardy, I see what it can do for my industry. And now Watson is hard at work in, you know, healthcare, in the legal profession, in finance, and call centers, you know, really making strong headways in, in things like oncology, helping, profess, uh, helping doctors, um, you know, find the right treatments for patients. So really important things, but sometimes you kind of have to, you know, take a little bit different track to get people to understand um, what you're trying to do and, and, and what you're trying to say. So um, kind of the learning there is about, um, you know, just, just go off track to be relevant if you need to, but always bring it back around to, to what's really important. Okay, so that event had a, had a really big impact on our brand and how people felt about IBM. Um, hmm. Sorry, just give me. So we um, continued to reach out to our um, researchers and our um, uh, scientists in the lab to figure out, well, what else is going on that people might really um, want to engage in and want to, you know, you know, that would help people, help a broader audience understand what IBM does. So we unearthed this um, scientist named Andreas Heinrich, who was working on um, atoms and how to move them and manipulate them, manipulate them and build, um, build hard drives out of them and really impact kind of the whole area of storage. And uh, which is important when you have so much more data and so much more that you want to store, you need bigger and different kinds of storage. So um, they were really pushing the boundaries here. And we thought, well, why don't we create a different kind of content? Create, actually create the content differently and create the content or the film out of atoms. And so we used what we call a scanning tunneling microscope, which is kept in a you know, distant room at negative 30 degrees, which is actually kind of what half the country is feeling right now, but um, you, you manipulate it from a, from a different remotely, and there's, you know, a, a, the microscope is like the size of, of a quarter of this room. And we asked them to, we, we did a storyboard with our friends, our partners at Ogilvy, created a little storyboard and asked the scientists, they literally moved 10,000 atoms into different shapes and to, to create this little story. So we um, created this little film of, Friendship and technology, it's simple and endearing, and, and we'll play it now if you could play the next video.
So this is the first video IBM ever did that got a million views on YouTube, and that happened overnight, and now it has five million views. And trust me, it's not about views. Um, that was a bit of an indication of traction, because for a B2B brand, it's pretty interesting that people were kind of engaging with, with this kind of technology. Um, what was fun was the parodies and the questions and the need for deeper content, and the fact that we have, um, we had created a behind the scenes where the scientists, the IBMers, really talked about how they did this, really getting deep into technology, and that was a really popular kind of longer form video. We also set up a, um, a camera in the lab where every night the researchers would do their little diary and say the pitfalls, the good, the bad, behind the scenes, what, you know, really short, a couple minutes. Um, and those were really popular. So it's always about allowing people to navigate to deeper content, allowing people to get more. Um, we never do anything that's just kind of a TV spot or just a video. We always try and create lots of content um, because first of all, in technology, people always want, there, there are always people who will want more. So we like to give that to them. So whatever it is from a TV spot to a demand gen piece, whatever we're putting out there, we give people a path for more, more deeper content. So that's kind of what we did here and it worked out uh, really well for us. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go, oops. So there are times where um, you know, we want people to experience our brand in a different way. So we call this experiential content. We want them to physically experience IBM. Really, really hard for an IBM, really hard for a B2B brand. Um, but here, a few things came together that made this possible. We had um, technologies we wanted to talk about, cloud and cognitive computing and Watson. We had a venue that could support that. It was um, South by Southwest last year, and we had um, food, and who doesn't like food, and talking about food and getting free food. Um, so this all came together at a food truck at South by Southwest, and it was a very you know, social campaign where we asked people to vote on the dish they wanted to eat the next day. So all through Twitter, they could vote on you know, the chocolate, Austrian chocolate burrito, or the Vietnamese apple kebab, the Belgian bacon pudding, whatever it was, and they would vote, and the next day, the winner would be made. But what, what, what's happening here with Watson is that Watson ingested Huge amounts of data, culinary data, chemical properties of food, ingredient pairings, um, different flavor profiles, th something called hedonomic psychophysics, which is the understanding of what people find pleasant and unpleasant. So, you know, cooking styles from around the world, all of this data that even a celebrity chef cannot keep in their mind, right? They cannot understand hundreds of thousands of ingredients, but Watson can. What a chef could do, and we worked with celebrity chefs here to do this, the, the celebrity chef could say, I want to make something with chicken and with you know, one other ingredient, and I want it to be an appetizer, and I want it to be from this region of the world. And Watson would give a list of 10 or 20 ingredients, not with the amounts, but the enough, enough that a, a chef could put it together. So if the chef used all the ingredients that Watson came up with, as weird as the, as the combinations may seem, they would get something never before tasted, but really incredibly good, because Watson can understand these flavor pairings better than a person. So what, Watson, what Chef Watson is able to do is help chefs be better chefs by partnering with them. So that's the idea behind Chef Watson, and the idea behind South by Southwest was to enable people to experience the brand, experience Watson, um, and it worked out, out really well. Um, and, you know, as always, we have, a, we have a Tumblr page called IBMbler, a page dedicated on IBMbler to, to Chef Watson. We have lots of content on, on our IBMbler site. But I'll just point to some, or something really fun about this is that there was a French Can Canadian contingent at South by Southwest who were tweeted, Chef Watson, make us poutine. For those of you who, who probably know, poutine is a French Canadian classic you know, dish of French fries, cheese curds, and gravy. That wasn't on our list, right? We had Austrian chocolate burritos on the list, but we didn't have poutine on the list. But we tried to be really flexible, and we said, okay, well, we can do this. And so the researchers and uh, the, the chefs and Watson, you know, they, they put together what they thought could be a really interesting poutine combination that no one had ever tasted before. And we tweeted back, sure, we'll make you poutine. Come on down to the truck tomorrow. It'll be there. And it was. And they made Peruvian potato poutine, and the Canadian, French Canadians loved it. This was IBM being nimble. <laughs> Usually those words don't go together. So we were really excited that we could respond, that we could do this, that we could be flexible, um, and had, had some fun with this. And um, we got tons of press about the whole program, but also tons of press just about 
and that flexibility. So always leave room for flexibility, always leave room for nimbleness. You know, things don't always go as planned, and sometimes that's a good way, sometimes not, but, but sometimes it works out. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta go for it. Um, and I, I believe I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna go through my last example, which was about, about made with IBM. Um, we could do that another time or on, in the town hall, but this was about um, what we did in the masters last year, creating 50 different spots for our 50 different slots on, on the masters and how the approach was about content creation, not advertising, and it was about getting our clients' points of view, not our point of view. Um, so with that, I will, I will wrap up with just um, one, one kind of big learning, which is everything that we do um, in this space is about this model of paid owned earned. Like, Advertising alone does, doesn't really do much for the brand anymore. Just creating content alone doesn't do much. Just doing PR alone. Everything we do is in this context of paid, owned, earned, where the social teams, the advertising team, the PR team, we sit together, we work together, we collaborate. We don't collaborate in one of those, sh let's share what each other's doing. We collaborate from the ground up. We really integrate programs um, because the paid spurs the earned, and everything we do on own spurs the, the earned, and the earned, you know, it, it, all, it all works together. As a, in a really deliberate model. So everything is about paid on earn. And, um, and everything is about, again, I, I know I mentioned this, but really important for us, it's all about creating content that enables people to go as deep into the topic or the brand as they want. So with that, um, I'll wrap it up and uh, get off.